said, I use the value thing across the board. That's true. Mm -hmm. It's just for perfectionists highlighting that they may have a value that's actually not in their control and being able to Mm -hmm. shift that. And so for the underperformers, I guess is one way to put that, but just like, that's the reality gap for high performers who are experiencing perfectionism and struggling. Then it's more about highlighting that a lot of times there's a value conflict where there's, I care about too many things. And if I focus on one, I'm giving up on the other. So I don't feel good about it. Right. Or I don't feel like I'm working hard enough on all the things. Welcome. Stick around if you want to learn about the art and philosophy of beautiful movement mixed with evidence-based exercise science. We'll be having tough and inspiring conversations with other coaches, experts, artists, and athletes. Our goal is to challenge myths, explore concepts, and engage in healthy debate as we dive deep with intrigue and curiosity. I'm your host, Hannah Deutscher. I've been teaching dance, Pilates, and yoga for over two decades. And what I've learned is that movement can be the joy that integrates us all together. When we can trust and express ourselves through our bodies, we are unlimited in our ability to change ourselves and our communities for the better. We, as movement teachers and coaches, have the power to help people experience this for themselves. Okay, everyone, let's dive in. Exchanging ideas and changing people's lives one session at a time. This is the Pilates Exchange. Dr. Chelsea Parati is a sports psychologist and high-performance coach for dancers and dance educators. As a speaker, workshop teacher, and podcast host, Dr. Chelsea's mission is to create happier, more successful dancers through positive mental skills. Visit her website and check out her podcast, A Passion for Dance. So welcome back to the Pilates Exchange. I'm really super excited to have our guest today, which is Dr. Chelsea Parati. She's going to tell you all about herself and what she does for a living. And we came across each other, or I actually have, I'm a fan girl (laughs) of her podcast and what she's doing to change the dance world for the better. So let's, let's just start off right there. Would you tell our audience a little bit more about yourself, Chelsea? Of course. Thank you for having me too. I'm excited to chat about it. So yeah, I'm Dr. Chelsea. I'm a college professor and sports psychologist. So I work usually with dancers and anybody kind of in that space. And it's about mental skills in dance, trying to help dancers be happier and more successful and using positive mental skills to be able to get there. So that's things like confidence, mental toughness, resilience, skills like that. So it's helping teachers and dancers kind of develop those skills. So I love working with dancers of all ages and especially the teachers. I think that was kind of what got me into it in the first place was speaking to other teachers. And like, we can make such a difference when we have that ripple effect. Like if, if I can say something that helps one teacher, that teacher is going to go impact hundreds. So that is kind of the, the focus. I love helping anybody who is educating others on how to do it in a way that's going to help foster that resilience and love for the work they're doing. And that is exactly why I found you. (laughs) (laughs) Yay! (laughs) You said it all. So I was, I was kind of like stalking your, your Instagram for a while, which I'm going to put all the links to Dr. Chelsea's page on here, but there was an interesting thing that happened a few months ago where it was, you know, Instagram is funny because we put these like 10 second things out there, 15 second things. And right. sometimes we don't know the background of what's going on. So I, I had responded to something and it was about feedback of like, what's our responsibility as teachers creating environments where the students, and this was specifically about younger dancers, but, but the students receiving that feedback and how they should be grateful for that feedback because it is mm-hmm. a a give and a take of course from the teacher and the student and it just really got me thinking about what my past was as as a young dancer then moving on to my professional life as a dancer and then that transition now as a teacher of just adults so that's kind of where i would love to go deep with you on today <laughs> yes i'd love to Awesome. What do you think, how do we, this is a big question. How do we create environments where we are, we're a learning environment? How do we create 
and foster a learning environment that's both positive but constructive and we're getting the work done that needs to be needs to be done. Like there has to be some sort of corrections in there somewhere. We can't just be right. <laughs> positive the whole time. Right. What is that? You're right. And it is a big question. And so there's not one piece to it, but mm-hmm. there's let's see, we can take it a couple different ways. One big thing I think with establishing that learning environment is setting really clear expectations. And then there's the the positive and the encouragement along the way to those expectations. But that's, if you don't have any clear expectations about what to expect, when that could be from what the, how hard this challenge is going to be, how, you know, maybe difficult choreography, maybe a new skill that you've never tried before, like that they're, it's going to push you. It's going to be a challenge. You're not going to get it right away. I don't expect you to get it right away, right? Like setting these expectations first, but then with that, the level of encouragement and the feedback to get there. So it's setting setting a high bar, but then kind of walking alongside them to get there. It's like, I believe you can get this high and I'm going to set the bar up here because that's my job as your teacher, as your coach, is to help get the most out of you right, and facilitate that. But I wouldn't set it this high if I didn't think you could get there. So this is what we're doing and how I'm going to help you get there if you're willing to do the work. And so it's kind of constantly putting it back on them of like, you have to want to do that work. And if you want it, then I absolutely want to help you get there. And I will offer the feedback and the corrections and the praise when you're working hard, right, to help make it happen. So I think when it goes awry are the two extremes where you have the environment that's just positive and happy, which is fun. But if you have goals and you have you know, things you want to accomplish, then that can leave you lacking, right? It just feels like I'm just coming in and having fun. And there's a place for that for sure. But if that's not what you want, if that's not what the person's after, you won't really see any growth because you just stay very stable. And then the other extreme of all hard work, all discipline, all fight, no praise and no encouragement and nothing happy. So there's like, it has to be both in a way that you were creating that environment that has both so that people will make the progress they want to make, but believe that it's possible, right? And maybe believe that something's more than they even thought, right? I think that's a lot of times a teacher sees more than the person does, right? I believe you can do this even if you don't see it yet. Yeah, mm, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I like to, when I'm when I'm teaching is sort of normalize the idea that in order for us to reach something that's hard, we're going to have to fail a couple times. Like mistakes yes. are part of that learning process. Is that sort of the, ex- talk about those exactly. expectations that you're talking yes. about? Oh, right. Yes. yes. Love that. You always uh, want to create that expectation that anything you're learning, especially for an adult. And I think if we're talking to adult learners or more advanced learners, they are learning something more challenging that's not going to happen the first time, right? You're not learning something really simple. You're trying something really new or more challenging at a new level, whatever it is that you're pushing yourself to, it's not going to come on the first try. It's just rare, right? That something is just going to happen that first time. So I think especially with movement, because there's usually like this awkward coordination place where you're like, oh, that didn't feel right. Like I, or I thought I was doing that and I'm not. And it, takes a little while to work out the full body coordination to things. And so, yeah, setting that clear expectation of like, this is not going to be pretty the first time you do it. It's good. Like you got to just do it and you got to just go for it, right? Or it's going to feel awkward or it might, you might not have the strength to do it yet. And we're going to do, we're going to baby step it and get you to that. And just setting that clear expectation that it's not going to be flawless right away. And that's not the goal. So it's like you said, mistakes are part of it and it's how you learn. And it's, Mistakes and also just the the progress of it, knowing that like every little piece is part of this and you have to enjoy some of the progress and the process of it and not just have this joy of like, once you finally get the scale, you're like, okay, I did it. I'm done. I'm like, well, then that's no fun, right? And it's all the process it took you to get there to celebrate. Yeah. I like that little bit of friction also of, of that when it gets a little bit uncomfortable and then we finally get the thing, that's what... I think is where that dopamine hit comes in. Yeah. Where it's like, oh yeah, we did it. That's amazing. Absolutely. You know? yeah, yeah. I love saying that you have to be comfortable 
being uncomfortable. Like that's a big part of mental toughness is learning that this little bit of uncomfortable is good and exciting and not something to run away from. Right. And Mm -hmm. so when we are talking to people about building that mental toughness and that resilience, mental toughness is really about understanding your, your emotions and your feelings so that you know when you're a little uncomfortable, a little nervous, but you can lean in and when you are really not in a good place and you need to step back and protect, right? But it's understanding yourself enough and understanding what it truly feels like. And we, I see it a lot, especially in teenagers, but I think it's true across the lifespan that people are getting a little uncomfortable or a little anxious and they immediately stop rather than having that sense of like, no, this is, I'm a little nervous about this, or I'm a little anxious, or I'm not sure. But then understanding like, but that's where this growth is going to come from. Like, and back to your question about environment, like I'm in a safe place with a teacher who's not going to let me do something that's going to hurt me, right? Or my teacher is, you know, they've helped me set this up. They're guiding me, they're spotting me, whatever, so that you know you're safe, like you're physically safe. So take a deep breath and go for it and be able to be comfortable with that little bit of friction. I like that word. That little bit of friction is like a lean in friction, not a stop and hold back. Mm. And I think something that you just said was powerful. It's about we're in a safe place to do this, this yeah. thing. And I think also with that is there's the the safe place of it as a physical place, like I'm whatever sort of movement skill we're teaching, I'm not going to let you fall. You're not going to, you know, tumble down. You're strong enough. Like I, I believe that you can do that. There's that sort of foundation, but there's also a foundation. I believe that sometimes teachers need to do a little bit more thinking about is the, the safety, the mental safety yeah, in the environment. And that's an expectation. Like we can fall out of this thing. You won't get hurt doing it, but I would never laugh at you for trying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that sometimes our humor can come off as like, oh, this is a really unsafe place for me to try stuff Uh, out. Yeah. That's a good point. Absolutely. And I think you're right. That mental safety is just as important if someone is going to be vulnerable. That's what we're asking them to do is to try something in the presence of others, which is scary for a lot of people. And there's personality traits where some people are a lot more comfortable in like trying something new, no matter who's watching and other people are really not okay. But creating a space where they can, like I said, be vulnerable and try it and know, really it's knowing that there's not going to be a poor judgment, that you're not going to make fun at me, laugh at me, roll your eyes at me, right? Like anything that you feel judged. And I think adults have a hard time with that because we are like have this image of like, I'm supposed to be an adult. I'm supposed to have it figured out. Like the being vulnerable and trying something new as an adult seems especially scary. Like we encourage the 10 year old, we're like, oh, you're, you're 10, you're try, it's great. And then, but if you want to try something brand new at 30, it feels scarier somehow of this sense of like, it's, it's not comfortable or I'll be judged because I can't do it. I've never tried it before. And so it's up to the teacher to help kind of create that environment of, of emotional support and encouragement and that there is genuinely no judgment. And what happens too, I think, is we have to explicitly say it, right? And just be willing to, when you have that first introduction with someone that you are teaching, like that this is something where I care about your your ability to just go for it and try. And I love seeing effort. I love seeing you go for it. I will never judge you for it. But then you have to walk the walk too. So making sure you're not just like setting the safety, like I'm saying a disclaimer at the beginning, like you have to do it too and make sure you're following through. And your point about humor is good because I think to many people, humor is not meant to be offensive or hurtful. It's like their own protection or their own uncomfortableness in this moment. Yeah. So knowing like if humor is your go-to, that's okay if that's who you are and that's your personality, but understanding who your client is or who you're teaching and how that might impact them differently um, and or letting them just get to know you better before there's that a level of humor, right? You just, you got to find that balance with any sort of personal connection of how that's going to be taken. Yeah. And there's a lot of different, I guess, forms of humor that sure. go into that. And Christian and I tend to be very, we're very funny, jokey people. And so our, that is our, actually a, a big part of our teaching tools, but mm-hmm. it would never be to make fun of someone. Right. But I have been, unfortunately, in learning environments where that had been 
the air quotes here, the motivational tool that was used right. and it was a, a sarcastic humor or something like that. Yes. And that can be a lot That's more devastating. Painful. Yes. When yeah. it is like either because it's mocking or it's, yeah, that kind of stuff. Usually, even if you are someone who loves humor, that doesn't feel good, especially when it's in front of others or it's somebody who is trying to teach you. And then you said like, it's supposed to be motivational and it's just not, <laughs> it's no. just not what's going to help someone want to come back and keep trying. And it's a little of, I think old school in any sport, in any, I see it in dance and arts too, of, and for the record, I consider dance a sport too, but anything back in kind of old school teaching of it was a lot more like bullying for motivation, like getting in your face and threatening or mocking. And like, that was just the norm for so long that trying to, for, I think a lot of, uh, I'll speak for myself now and like middle adulthood have been teaching for a long time. I'm still trying to rewrite some of like, but that's how I was taught. So like, shouldn't that be what I am doing and understanding? Like, just because it was, doesn't mean it's good now and we know better. So let's do better. That is exactly why we do what we do. We have this whole program that is to take a look at some of these old methods that have been really ingrained in the way that we do things and to unpack them, take a look and say, okay, was there something of value there? Sometimes not. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And what can we do to rewrite it? Because it becomes so embedded into what we do do, how we talk, how we even look at people moving, how we unconsciously judge things that are happening and to, to, I don't know if it's take a look, unpack it. That's the only way I can say is we have to unpack and say, okay, what's, what are the tools that I actually need in this? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, like, I can still say to like my old dance directors and many of them who helped me along the way, like I achieved so much because of them. Like they still helped me get to where I was. There doesn't, it doesn't mean every method was the right thing that I want to hold on to. Like you said, unpacking, like were there aspects of that training that were good? Absolutely. Right. And how do I want to carry that forward? And then was there aspects of that that I don't want to carry forward in my own teaching? Sure. Yes. So it's not necessarily about judging even the people, right? They were doing their best with what they had at the time. And again, now we can learn from that and move to try to teach differently. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I think that you're further along and you're not being <laughs> judging. <laughs> Maybe. I, yeah. I mean, I, I it's something that's been intentional for me. I will say it's been intentional for a while. And kind of in the last couple of years, connecting with some people that I danced with in some of those harder times and recognizing that like I came out of it better than some others in the sense that like it, you know, everybody's personality is different and how they react to things. And then what home life was like, what school was like, like it's all this combined thing. It's not just that one experience, but like talking to other dancers about, we all had the same like occurrence, like the same event, but yet experienced it very differently. And Mm -hmm. understanding that that tends to be true. That's just human nature, right? That we were at the same thing or we were in the same class, but we had very different experiences with it that shaped us differently. And so that's, to me, it's, it's the psychologist in me, it's the nature nurture in both directions and all of that, that it's, what events that I was a part of, but also how I responded to them. And that's been a lot of my growth and journey is like, I can control how I respond to those things. I can't always control what happens, but I can control the response to them. I love that. That's what I'm working on. But I'm all, I'm also, <laughs> I think at this point, choosing what I've learned from the experience. So yeah. although the response has been like, oof, yeah, don't want to go back. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like, and it is a very complex thing, but it is, uh, it is choosing some from some of the maybe the experiences that were extremely painful from the the teaching part of it. Like, what what can I do different and better for my learning tools? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I think that you touched on something that is really important for us as teachers of adults, and of course of children as well, recognizing that. The person that's in front of us on that day has a whole multitude of things that they're bringing into that room and that experience. Yeah. Because sometimes what happens is when we're teaching and we're noticing a facial expression, or maybe it was a big breath, or maybe it was an eye roll, like it could be anything that happens on the other side. 
it gets responded to by us as the teachers. And we can put a story that said, oh, well, she doesn't like the training or she's in pain or not that again, whatever it is. And right. But that person maybe just, it was a late train. They had a fight sure. with their spouse and all. <laughs> yes. They bring their own stuff in and we have yeah. to work with ourselves as yes. the teachers to be the clean slate as well. That's yeah. hard. It is very hard. And it's so true that we create a story where there is none. That's just natural. And it's how our brains work. We want to put it together. So to a lot of teachers, I'll say, especially if you flip it, where you're the one who missed your train, you're coming in and not in a good place and you're supposed to be the teacher doing your best. Obviously we always try to be present in that moment. I'm not a fan of the old adage, leave it at the door, because I think that is, we're not acknowledging the truth of where we're really at. And so it's not an excuse. Like if I had a horrible day of whatever happened before I get to my class, it's not an excuse to come in and just tell them like, ah, I had a crappy day. So just get deal with it today. Like, no, I'm going to try to be present in the moment, do whatever grounding I need to do to be ready, but also to acknowledge for a minute and be a little bit of that vulnerability of, and modeling, right? Of like I had a rough morning or like, I'm a little flustered coming in today, but I'm going to start today's class with a few good deep breaths and I want to be here for you. So let's like take that, you know, will you come with me? Right. So just like acknowledging it and, but it's not a, and it's not an excuse to not have your best class. And I think that's where people, it's like you had whatever's going on and we all have a million things. Like that's not an excuse to not show up for yourself, to not show up and have your best class and give your best effort. And like getting used to that getting used to being present right now, doesn't matter what happened before. doesn't matter what is going to happen after, but practicing like presence and being truly aware of who you are and where you are right now and not bringing the baggage with you. And I think as teachers, we can model that some for people to realize like, I'm not, I don't like fake it till you make it either. I have all sorts of sayings that I am not a fan, of, but <laughs> no one, it's like, you're not faking it either. It's like, no, this is who I genuinely am right now. This is real for me right now, but I'm not going to let that harm who I like this class or how I show up for you because I value being a good teacher. So it's more of like putting a different hat on, right? Like maybe I had a bad morning because something happened at home. I had a, you know, one of my, my kids are being frustrating. Something happens at home and I have to like take the mom hat on, put the teacher hat on and show up and be my best. But that takes intention and we can model that for people because we, everybody has to do that. And then to your point that they, we don't know if they were able to do that or not, or what's going on for our students or what they're bringing in or struggling with. And when there's a lack of information, we make up a story and then we are self-involved and that's how our brains work. And so it's, the story is usually about us, right? Like you said, we make it up that it is about that. They don't like something that they're annoyed, that they're frustrated or they make it about us. And it's usually not, <laughs> you know, or you shouldn't have a conversation, but it's usually not. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that kind of protection for yourself too, of knowing that's like, I, I brought my stuff here today and I'm trying my best to let it go. And I'm just going to do the same for them and let them, you know, have, the space to also let it go and be present. That's hard. Mm -hmm. It's very hard. It is super hard. I, I've in a one-to-one -one situation like that, that sort of training environment, I would be more apt to check in with the person and say, Hey, like I noticed that it seems like you're a little bit more frustrated today. Is there is mm -hmm. that, am I reading that right? Is there something that we could change in the way that we're approaching training today? And I found that even just unpacking that little bit of like noticing yep. those cues that I'm getting helps me be more present with them. Cause it, it yeah. also clicks them into like, oh no, I didn't mean that. Or yes, actually right. it was, this was going on yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it diffuses it. So it doesn't become like something that's uh huge. Right. Well, and I love the way you said that too, where you were just frame of like, you're, it's not confrontational. It's back to the environment. It's not like, you know, you're rolling your eyes at me. Like what is, what is going on? Right. It's like, I'm noticing, right. It's just, it's not a judgment and it's not that you're doing anything wrong. This is what I'm noticing. And basically like, would you like it, anything to change because of that? Or how, you know, how are you? And being able to just say, I've noticed this. And if there's something I can do to adapt today, I would, I'm happy to do that. If, if not, that's okay too. And then, yeah, you get the genuine response of somebody's like, "Oh no, sorry, like I, I didn't. I'm good. Like let's let's keep going." Or somebody's able to say, "Like, yeah, I'm actually just not in a good mood today, so I might not talk a whole lot, but I want to do this." 
right? And then you know, you're like, okay, cool. We won't have to talk as much today, but we're going to proceed, right? And yeah, I think that's a great subtle check-in. And that's back to the safe environment. They, You notice who they are as a human and not just the mover that you're working with in the moment, right? That there's, there's more to them than that. Mm-hmm. What do you have tool-wise, sometimes where we were talking about before, like there's spectrums of like learners mm-hmm. and feedback that we can give. And the way that I think about some of my learners, my movers, is that we have sometimes a very, very, I don't know if type A, I don't know what that that really is, but like people that are very high achievers and also very self-critical on one mm-hmm. end. Yep. And I feel like that communication needs to be, when I'm giving feedback, that needs to be different for the other side of the spectrum. Yeah. Do you find that also? Is that, am I making that up? No, you're not making that up. Okay. (laughs) And I think so many dancers, we tend to be on the perfectionism side, on the, on the type A side, but not everybody is, and they're going to receive feedback differently. Yeah. When I started teaching, I felt underprepared and overwhelmed. I needed to learn how to plan my training so that it made sense, but I wasn't sure what was working and what wasn't. So many teacher training programs leave out the actual art and business of teaching. This is why we created Train the Trainers. Train the Trainers is designed to give you the tools you need to create a powerful learning environment for your students. Gain access to the vault of our collected knowledge where you can learn everything we have to teach you, whether you are a freelance teacher or a studio owner. Get constructive feedback on your teaching with actionable tools you can apply immediately. We can't wait to be part of your teaching journey and to help you grow in your business. Welcome to train the trainers. Are there tools that let's go with the, maybe the side that I'm more comfortable living in as a dancer, as a teacher, what sort of tools can we, can we help our learners that maybe are on that side that they're very, very hard on themselves? Mm -hmm. Sure. So with perfectionism, my go-to for that is to help work with dancers on being present. Because by definition, if you are worried, you're having perfectionist thoughts, you're worried about something that already happened in the past, or you're worried about showing up somehow or achieving something in the future. It's perfectionist thoughts are, I can't believe I messed that up. What if somebody saw me? What? Or it's future oriented. This has to be good enough. I have to be able to be seen. It has to achieve X, Y, Z. So they're rarely in the present moment. And so with that, those thoughts, it's, doing lots of different sort of, we say grounding, but it's in the, I think in the five senses, when you look for tools, I love to just be, let's be practical. Being with your five senses in, so you're more present in the moment. So it can be visually looking around for a minute, tell me five things you see and being able to point out, it's like, okay, I see the candle over there. I see the lamp that I see the green lamp. I see the window, like just five things you are here in this room right now. You can think about like, what do you close your eyes? Take a few deep breaths. What do you smell? You know, how does, how does your shoulders feel like going into your body, like your breath, any physical sensations. So just coming back to the present helps. So with those sort of perfectionist dancers, a lot of times I'll start, start class or start one-on-one time with them in a intentional presence, right? And being, being able to be self-aware so I know mindfulness is big and is growing in its work. And it's something that can help a lot of that perfectionism because it's about being present in the moment and about not letting your thoughts go too far to the past and the future, but staying current. And so, yeah, I start with presence with a lot of that, those thought, those perfectionism. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I wonder if this, like as uh, taking those practical tools that you just said, I wonder if as a teacher, when we're noticing that someone is Mm -hmm. going down that route, if we can, at least in the Pilates world, like slightly change what we're doing in that moment to being like, okay, push the push through bar to this point. So it's a task oriented thing. Your hands are on there. Can you grip it a little bit tighter, grip it a little bit looser, or have something where we're, we're grounding them in the moment, take a big breath over here exhale it until you reach this point. So we're doing all of those things that you're just talking about and helping them create that environment. 
that yeah, way for absolutely. Our, Anything yeah. that's going to keep them yeah, present and aware of their physical sensations and in the moment. And it's something if you're noticing too, I think obviously easier in a one-on-one, but if somebody is getting like really frustrated, right? Like it's not good enough. It's not good enough. It's not good enough. Being able to stop and ask like, okay, if this, if you were going to rate it one to a hundred, like what is like, where are you at? And nobody ever says a hundred, like nobody ever says that it's perfect. And especially a perfectionist, even if they do feel really good about it, they're still not going to say it's a hundred, right? There's always room for growth. And so like, what would it take to be at 100? And is that even what we're trying to do here? Right? Like what? Cause I think there's the point, the hope is that you see that like that 100 is a constant moving bar. And that's the point is it's like, every time you get better, your 100 moves. So you're never there and that's good. And that's back to enjoying the process, enjoying the class itself and not just like only focus on an outcome. So perfectionists tend to be focused on an outcome, right? I'll be successful when I achieve this. I will be good enough when I get this recognition or when I reach this certification, you know, like that next bar rather than being process focused. So sometimes just anything in those conversations to focus on the process. And I love your examples going back to your body is there and then asking them kind of what, like what it would take. It's like, but once you move to that next level, the bar moved. And that's, that's the beauty of what we get to do of what we're training, like learning what our bodies can achieve and do and feel. And it's being present and enjoying the process of it, not just being focused on what I could get to what's the end game. Mm -hmm. Cause there is no end game. Yeah. (laughs) Right. That's, that is very, that's very true. I had the uh, breakthrough in my, in my desk career when working through this idea of like, what, well, what is perfect? What am I trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, well, what is, yeah, at that point I was more into ballet than contemporary dance. And I was like, trying to figure out like, all right, what is, what is ballerina? What, what mm-hmm. does that look like to me? And then at a certain point I said, oh, well, actually the construct of ballerina is in my own mind. It is a imaginary thing yeah. that I'm creating. And so I couldn't even picture her, what, what that was in my mind, it was always someone else like, okay, well, I love yeah. this ballerina. I love this ballerina, but it wasn't a, a something that I could achieve because it mm-hmm. wasn't real. This person right. was dancing, you know, that person was dancing. I liked her dancing. And so once that was eliminated, a little, then it was like, there was so much more freedom yeah. to the way that I was able to express myself in my, in my own body. Yes. Oh, Does I, love that, that. I think, yes. And there's, it's kind of the overarching definition of success. And it can mm-hmm. be, what is success as a teacher? What is success on stage? What is success as a ballerina? I did the same thing as a ballerina. You have this image, but what we tend to do when we say like, oh, what do I want to be? Or who do I want to look like? We take bits and pieces from all these people we admire. I love her strength. I love her feet. I love his jumps. I love like we, but no one is that combination of people. They have their own strength. And then, but we just look, we compare ourselves to like the best pieces of everyone else wanting to get there. I'm like, that's not the point. And no one on stage is the best at all of the things they have found their unique style and their aesthetic and their body and being able to use it to the best that they can. And so, yeah, I love that, that freedom that you find when you are able to let go and say, I can admire those things and I can then find what fits me and what fits my style and my aesthetic and what my body can do and be able to find like success that is self-defined right? That you are in control of whatever that success picture looks like rather than trying to achieve something that looks like somebody else or something that a success that only comes when somebody else tells you, right? Like when people say, I'll only be successful when I have a professional contract. I'm like, but that's somebody else's choice (laughs) ultimately, right? Like you can do all the work and you can go to all the auditions, but then eventually somebody else is making that choice. So like making success about your, you and what you can control. Absolutely. Absolutely. What if we shift the focus to movers? Okay. So we have the one side of the spectrum of like the highly, highly motivated people that come in. And then we have the, maybe the opposite end of the spectrum. There are people that show up and they do just enough. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) These are the type of people where when I'm 
coaching my teachers, the, this is the group of learner that tends to get the most frustration from my teachers. Absolutely. Because like, teachers are usually not that person. That's why we're teaching. <laughs> that's so it. it's hard. Exactly. <laughs> Do we have any tools yes. over on that area? Yes. Good question. And so true, right? We get frustrated on that side much more easily because like you said, you started with the one you were comfortable with. Like we tend to empathize more on the perfectionism side, but there are plenty of learners who are not and more on the, what do I need to do to get by? So, and actually I would use this on both sides, but it it resonates with that kind of just skating by side of talking about their values. Like, why are you coming to class? Like, why does this matter to you? And you get all sorts of answers. And a lot of times I feel like you have to ask why there's a rule about this. And I can't remember who it's from, or I would quote them, shoot. But it's like the five whys of asking like, okay, well, why are you coming every week? Right. Or why do you want to be here? And it's like, well, I want, you know, I want to be fit or I want to be, I like, I just like movement. I used to be a dancer. I just want to keep moving. Right. It's something that's like very kind of basic, right? Like, okay, well, why do you want to be fit? And then you get an answer. It's like, okay, I want to, like, I like the way it feels when I'm stronger. Okay. It's like, well, why do you like that? And why do you like, why, why, why? And you keep going. And eventually somebody will notice, hopefully that there's like this deeper value to it. And it can be that you, you know, value longevity because I want to be there for my family. It could be that you value, you know, just that I am happier when I feel fit. And so I value my own sense of like happiness and I want to be able to, you know, to, to, to achieve that. So you get to the why, why are you here? Why do you even care? <laughs> why do you matter? Cause you've lost it. Cause you're showing up and going through the motions and obviously saying this not in a confrontational way, but being able to highlight, right. That you're like, why this, why you're coming and the values, because people usually have a value or a goal And then their behavior is some tier below that. It's like, Mm -hmm. but if you want this thing and you, or you value, so it's either, sometimes it's an external goal, right? I want to fit into this thing. I want to, you know, look this way. And sometimes it's hopefully more value-based, but still there's something they want and their behavior doesn't match that. And it's pointing out a little bit of a reality gap of like, this is what you say you want, and this is the work that's happening. And again, no judgment from me. I don't, I'm here and I will teach you either way. So if you are genuinely fulfilling your values and your goals by just kind of showing up and doing the minimum and like, you know, going through it today, that's where you're at. And then you as a teacher have to let go of the judgment that they don't have as big of a goals as you're used to. That's okay. They may not. But if they do genuinely have a bigger goal or a deeper value that they're not reaching, being able to highlight this discrepancy. And again, it's not a judgment and it's not saying that they have to, but highlighting like, if that's truly what you want, how do you have to show up today to make that happen? What has to happen in class today? Or like, what's one thing that we can do in this class that's going to help you be work towards being that person? Because when we are so outcome focused or we're so worried about goals and dreams that are like really far away even, right? or like non-tangible, then it's easy. Like, well, I'm just not going to, I don't feel it in class today. So I'm not going to, it's like, well, you may not be feeling it today, but it doesn't have to be the best class you've ever had, but can you do something today so that you walk out feeling like you did something for yourself that feels good? Mm -hmm. And again, that bar might be lower than the perfectionist teacher is used to, and that's okay. (laughs) But finding that place of highlighting the reality gap a little bit and what they want, and then It's connecting the behavior to what they want because we tend to talk like a vision board, but then we don't do the work. Mm, So that's true. What's the what's the behavior? And it could be a small thing. It could be, you know, one small aspect of class today that'll help you get there. But no, it just helping them notice like, is this is this who you want to be? Because usually the answer is no. (laughs) And there's a there's a minute to sit with it. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, and I'll do it with kids. I asked my seven-year-old daughter, like when she's having a rough time and like making, you know, gets frustrated with something. I was like, is this, do you want to be this, you know, person that is, gets really upset and emotional? Do you want to be this person that yells at a friend? She's usually like, no. It's like, of course you don't want to be the person who yells at a friend. No one does. Right. It's like, no, I don't want to. I'm like, okay, you don't have to. 
your emotions aren't in control. Like you decide you don't want to be that person. So what do we do instead? And it's like putting the motivation back on them. Like if you don't want that, then you change it and back to what's in your control and what you can decide to do with it. I like that. Yeah. I feel like sometimes in situations where we have maybe a person that is not as motivated as maybe I would like, or mm-hmm. or maybe even that they would like. Something we talk about is that they borrow motivation for me for a short while. Mm, so yeah. that like I could carry you through a span, you know, maybe mm-hmm. it's a class or a couple of classes where you could just lean on it, just show up and okay, right. I got you. I'm I'm your right. cheerleader. But at some point then I'm going to, just like you're saying, we're going to have to turn around and have that little bit yeah. of uncomfortable talk, but let's, let's see where we're not aligned in the same way so that I could support you finding that intrinsic motivation that, yeah. that I know you have because you showed up like, right. You're here. You, yeah. You did it. Like that's, that's already like a huge thing that tells me that you want something from this experience, but that- yeah, no. And I think with that intrinsic motivation, there's usually kind of three main things that help people feel it. And as a teacher, I think that's part of the environment we can create to help that happen. And as a teacher, you have to separate a little bit of like, you can create the environment and do all the right things. And ultimately they're going to step into it or not, but you can totally do the, all the things to help set it up. And one is like, people need to feel, yeah. they have to feel a sense of autonomy and control. So that is kind of asking, it can be little things as a teacher of like, you know, which, do you have a favorite exercise I want to make sure we work into today? Or like, do you, what, you know, um, what combo of style, what style do we want to do today? Do we, what, you know, I'm picturing like a jazz class, right? Do you want to like sassy? Do we want fussy? Do we want hard hitting? Like, what do you want today? Little bits of autonomy that help where a little sense of control helps people feel motivated, right? I have a little sense of power here. And then they don't need to be carried because they're getting that power, right? Yeah. Then people want to feel a sense of mastery or a sense of progress, like they're getting somewhere. And a lot of times they may not notice they're getting somewhere. And I think with a lot of movement and skills, the progress is not seen for a while, right? You don't have these huge markers where all of a sudden you're like, see, I'm so much better than yesterday. I'm like, you may not feel that, but you are a lot better than three months ago but we tend to not look back that far. We only look back to yesterday or two days ago. So teachers can kind of help highlight like a longer sense of progress and a longer, like, do you remember when we just started this and this is how, you know, and like highlighting how far people have really come and helping highlight the progress again, even if you can't do it yet, but you're better than you were. So feeling that sense of progress and then they want to feel that sense of connection, which is everything we were talking about at the beginning of that sense of, purpose that's bigger than them, connection to other people, belonging here, right? Being heard, all of that helps so much. So teachers can set up that environment where, you know, you have your students have those, that sense of autonomy, that sense of like progress and mastery and connected. Um, And it's then establishing that and hoping that they choose to move forward with it and hold on to it. Um, And many of them, well, because like you said, they showed up, they're already there. So there's some sort of natural desire that, or they wouldn't have come. So I think the tools that you're talking about are really useful across the board. And I think that they could apply in, you know, from our super high achievers, perfectionists to maybe the people that we don't view as a super high achiever, but really have that they're showing up, they're doing the work and maybe it's just bringing highlighting for them what they're achieving and what those values are. So I think those tools yeah. are going to go all the way, absolutely, all the way across. The and the, board. like I said, I use the value thing across the board. That's true. Mm-hmm. It's just for perfectionists highlighting that they may have a value that's actually not in their control and being able to mm-hmm. shift that. And so for the underperformers, I guess is one way to put that, but just like, that's the reality gap for high performers who are experiencing perfectionism and struggling. Then it's more about highlighting that, a lot of times there's a value conflict where there's, I care about too many things. And if I focus on one, I'm giving up on the other. So I don't feel good about it. Right. Or I don't feel like I'm working hard enough on all the things. And so more Mm -hmm. so highlighting, you have too many things, (laughs) you have too many things that you value, or it's also okay and natural for those values to shift and change a little bit and learning to, to roll with that and be okay with that shift in focus. So values are huge, no matter who you are and kind of where you are in that spectrum. But 
And the teacher themselves too. Yeah, that that's true. And, and the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta also do that that work and always be continuously checking, checking yeah. back into where we are on there. We we try to schedule regular check-ins with our with our clients just to make sure, you know, whether it's in a group class or even in a you know, a personal training to recognize how far we've come mm-hmm. and to realign on where we're going. And I, yeah. just like you were saying that I, I feel like that three to four months is really nice for us yeah, to see because that, there's like those little movement pattern changes. They're not recognizable, just like you're saying, like from yeah. one training to the next or one week to the next, but it takes a little bit of time. You're like, Oh, remember it was right. like, you couldn't what do that happened? before. And now look at us. We've done yeah, it. <laughs> absolutely. Oh it's, yeah. And I think that's a perfect timeline to recognize, to notice the growth and celebrate the growth and then reflect on how you have felt during that time and what it has, the emotions that went through it. If there was something really hard, how did you react to that? And, you know, notice the emotional growth that came with it. Or if there's something that's shifting outside of that part of your life, like something else is going on and that's impacted how you are showing up. And so does that mean that the values here are going to shift a little bit? Like, A lot can happen in three months. A lot can change. And being able to pause and notice and reflect before you just power through, I think is hugely valuable. When we're doing this, just so as we're talking about like tools of how, how do we do that? So it's a lot easier, of course, in a one-to-one, but I do tend to like in a, in a group class situation, sometimes at the end of a class, I'll throw in like in a more mindful moment as we're closing, like a, an introspective question, like yeah, reflect back. Like if we did, especially if we were working towards a harder exercise teaser or whatever, whatever that, that hard Pilates exercise or yoga thing that we're doing, remember back when we were here and now we're here, how do you feel, you know, take a mm-hmm. deep breath into that. And yeah, I think that's so wonderful. It, there's so many small moments, the very beginning of class, sometimes in in the middle, but definitely at the end and taking time to pause and reflect on that day, reflect on the last few weeks. And then thinking about like, was there something really good about today that you want to carry forward into tomorrow? Was there something that you noticed in your body that felt different? Like to hold on to that, remember that before we come back. Like those, like I said, as a teacher, you're just teeing it up and you don't know for sure where they're going to go with it. But many adults, I think in this space, like we understand the value of that and want that. And it's an important part of class. Yeah. I love that you do that. That's awesome. I would love to say, first of all, thank you for your time today and for sharing with our, with our teachers, everyone that's out there, your wisdom. Is there any parting, parting words of wisdom of (laughs) what we should be thinking about? (laughs) Yeah. Oh, I guess I come to the same, I kind of did the thread the whole way through of control the controllables and whether you're the teacher or the student, but that you can control your actions, which includes reactions, as we were saying, like you can control your own actions. You can control your concentration, what you decide to put focus on. It doesn't mean you can control your thoughts and a lot of things that you think are not true. So it's not necessarily believing everything, but that you can kind of control what you're concentrating on and what you're thinking about, which is more about concentrating on the present, thinking about my body and thinking about, you know, how my hands are placed on the bar. Like you can shift your concentration and then your effort. Ultimately, those are those big things in your control. And so as to the teachers, especially, we are teachers a lot because of our hearts and our desire to give and you can't control how it's received. And on the other side of it, you also don't often see how it was received and how much of a difference it made years down the road. And that's hard as a teacher that like you made some internal shift for someone, but you never saw it happen, but you made it happen. And every once in a while, you get the good ones who will like tell you (laughs) explicitly that something changed for them, but usually not. So knowing for yourself that like your sense of success as a teacher and your sense of achievement as a teacher is in the things that are in your control to set up more of those moments that you may never get to see. It's like, you know, planting the seeds that you may not get to see, but it's such a beautiful way to live anyway, that you find happiness. That's your own. I totally agree. Thank you so very, very much. (laughs) Of course. Happy to. It was really nice to chat with you. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. 
A great cost-free way of supporting us and the podcast would be to give us a five-star rating. You can also look down into the show notes and grab any one of the free resources for teachers. I hope to see you next week on the Pilates Exchange. Happy teaching, everyone. Thank you.